In this video, I'm going to show you how to use Gauss's law to determine the electric field of a charged rod. And we had already done this a few units ago and figured out that that was the equation. And we did a lot of integration and it was kind of messy. In this case, we're going to use Gauss's law and it's going to be a lot easier and a lot more elegant. So let's see how it's done. First, we're going to identify the symmetry of the charge distribution and draw the appropriate Gaussian surface that touches the location where we want to find the electric field. So here it says that we want to find the electric field at a distance d away from the long thin rod. So I'll just say that my is right there. That's our distance d away from the rod. and we want to know what the electric field is at that point. Our appropriate Gaussian surface, since this symmetry is cylindrical symmetry, we are going to draw a Gaussian cylinder. And the center of the cylinder is going to have the same axis as the rod itself. And we have to make sure that that cylinder, that our Gaussian cylinder, touches the location where we want to find the electric field. So it has to touch here. trying the best I can to draw this symmetric around the rod. So it's going to be distance d up here, it's also going to be distance d away down there. Doesn't really look like that, but I think you get the picture. Alright, step one. Step two, on each face of your Gaussian surface, indicate the directions of E and DA. So, well, at distance D here, you know the electric field is going to be outwards. And we also know that the area vector at that point is also outwards. And they're parallel to each other here in this case. And that's going to be this true everywhere along the wall of this cylinder. So even down here, the electric field is outwards, and the area vector is also outwards, perpendicular to the surface and parallel to E. We have two other parts of our Gaussian surface. We have the left cap and the right cap. On the left cap, the electric field is also upwards, but the area vector for the left cap is outwards. And then same thing for the right hand cap. The electric field points up, but the area vector points out. That means that there's zero flux through the left cap and the right cap. Next, calculate Q enclosed the charge enclosed by the Gaussian surface. So our Gaussian surface encloses about this area of the rod. It doesn't enclose the entire rod. The rod is really long and we're just putting a small Gaussian cylinder across just a section of the rod. And how much charge is here that we've shaded in well, we know that the linear charge density is lambda. So the Q enclosed is going to be lambda times how long my imaginary cylinder is. So let's just say 
that our imaginary cylinder is length L. Don't worry, that L is going to drop out later. So there's the charge enclosed, right? The linear density times how long my imaginary cylinder is, that's going to be how much charge is inside the cylinder. Next, calculate the electric flux through all faces of your Gaussian surface. Well, the flux through the left end and the flux through the right end are zero because the electric field is uh, perpendicular to the area vector. The electric field does not poke out through the left end or the right end. However, the electric field does poke out through the wall of the cylinder. So we have to find the flux through the wall. And everywhere along the wall, the electric field is the same size, E. Right? As long as this imaginary cylinder is centered around the rod, then everywhere along the wall, the electric field is going to have the same value. And the area of the wall, you just have to figure out what that is. Now, if you think about a cylinder, the area for the wall of a cylinder, you could think of it as like unfolding a uh, piece of paper. Right? It's, it's rolled up, it's round, and then you unfold it, and it becomes a rectangle. So what's the area of that rectangle? The area of that rectangle is going to be this side L. Right, that's going to be like the height of the cylinder. And then the length of that rectangle is the circumference of the circle of our cylinder. And that is going to be 2 pi times the radius. And the radius of the cylinder is distance d, because remember, it is d away from the center. So that means that that area is 2 pi d times L. So that means that our flux through the wall is E times 2 pi times d times L. And therefore our net flux, adding together the left cylinder, the right cylinder, and the wall, we get e times 2 pi d l. Last step. Equate the flux with the enclosed charge over epsilon naught and solve for e. So our electric flux we said from before is e times 2 pi d times l. And then we are going to equate that with Q in charged over epsilon zero. And Q in closed, we figured out previously, was lambda times L. So that's going to be lambda times L divided by epsilon zero. Notice now the L's cancel, so the length of our imaginary Gaussian cylinder didn't matter. And then we just need to rearrange and solve for E. So that means E is going to be equal to lambda divided by 2 pi d times epsilon 0, which is exactly what we were supposed to get based on what we had previously derived. Great. Much easier than integrating, in my opinion. The trick, though, is to choose the appropriate Gaussian surface and calculate the flux through each one. So not much calculus, but it requires a little bit more conceptual thought. But I like this way a lot better. Really, really elegant. Okay.